Good morning. Bonjour. It is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Sean Aunchat Atlio. Uh, the National Chief is the hereditary chief of the Ahusat First Nation in British Columbia. Sean a accompli uh, deux mandats à titre de... He has served two terms as regional chief for the BCEFN. And this time, he committed to the principles of working together through inclusion and respect. An historic leadership was signed in March 2005, overcoming decades of discord among First Nations leadership in British Columbia. In 2003, and should graduated with a Master of Education in Adult Learning and Global Change from the University of Technology, Sydney, Australia, in partnership with the University of British Columbia, the University of the Western Cape, South Africa, and University of Linköping in Sweden. In 2008, the Vancouver Island University recognized his work, his commitment to education by appointing him chancellor, and he thus became the first indigenous chancellor in BC. In June 2010, he received an honorary doctorate of laws degree in education from Ontario's Nipissing University. Sa conjointe Nancy depuis 25 ans, il a deux enfants. Member of the Vancouver Board of Trade, and I had an opportunity to to meet uh, Tyson and his daughter uh, Tara. Um, uh, Sean Atlio was, uh, was elected uh, National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations in July of 2009 for a three-year term. So he's about two and a half years into that, that three-year term. Some of the key themes that the National Chief has, has emphasized during his, uh, his time uh, in, that, in this role is, and I think these really resonate very strongly with the uh, voluntary and charitable sector. First of all, we're all in this together. Our futures are inter interconnected. Secondly, that there's a strong economic case, let alone the social justice case, for investing in First Nations children and youth. Thirdly, that education, particularly a holistic approach to education, which I know many of you in the room would, would support, is the key way forward. And finally, uh, relevant to our sector, is that the philanthropic sector has a key role to play in working with First Nations on capacity building. So why am I here doing this introduction? Well, in December of 2010, YMCA Canada signed a historic accord with the Assembly of First Nations that's based on our mutual goal to ensure uh, that children, teens, and young adults across our country, First Nations and non-Aboriginal alike, uh, have the very best health outcomes possible. In June of 2011, I received an opportunity to act on this accord when I received a call to chair the national panel on First Nations elementary and secondary education for students on reserve. Since then, the national panel has uh, held eight regional roundtables across the country, one national roundtable. We have visited 30 First Nation communities, 25 First Nation schools, and had over 100 key meetings with leaders who have an interest in First Nation education. We're now in the process of writing our report so I actually can't tell you what, uh, what the report is going to say because we're actually deciding what it, what it should say. But I can tell you that uh, our motto that we've used through this process of students first is really, is really the answer. We need to focus on what's best for students, not the next generation of students, but the students of today. The most frequently asked question that I've had as the chair of the national panel is, one more panel, one more study, why is this going to be different? And we've asked ourselves that same question. What I can say is that I think that the stars are aligned differently than they have been in the past. I hope the stars are aligned differently. First of all, we're in a period of reconciliation. Following the apology for, the resident, for residential schools, 
uh, Canada's First Nations and Canadians need to reconcile and need to work together. I think the leaders, both of the federal government and under uh, Sean uh, Atlio as National Chief, have made a commitment that education is the focus, needs to be the focus. Um, we have the social justice imperative, and it's, it's, it's really a shame that, in fact, that hasn't been enough to, uh, to make the changes that are necessary. But that's, today we have added to that an economic and a demographic imperative, which collectively, uh, hopefully, will make the difference. And finally, and most importantly, we have been absolutely amazed at the young people that we've met across the country, at the First Nation leaders, political leaders, educational leaders, community leaders, who are absolutely dedicated to making a change. And with a collective approach, we can make that difference. We are an independent panel. I want to say that the Assembly of First Nations has res respected that independence every step of the way. We appreciate that. But I have to also say that the National Chief has been a great inspiration to us because of his personal dedication to, uh, to education of his people. I've learned uh, the importance of language and culture uh, as part of this uh, process. Um, Sean Atlio's language is called Nucha Nult. Um, I, I should tell you, I've also learned what Ainchut means, and it means everyone depends on you. Wow. <laughs> um, and it is, it is a, and in fact, I've often thought, I, I'm head of a federation, as you know as well, and I feel sometimes the 53 YMCAs and YMCA, YWCAs across the country are like herding cats. But when I feel the pressure of my job, I think of the National Chief with 634 First Nations, and I've often thought it's like herding cats in a fish market after an explosion at the catnip factory. <laughs> so National Chief, Kleko Kleko for your leadership. Chuchikwa Aunchut. Okay, we have a catnip um, image in our, and uh, an explosion and, and cats in our, in our imagery. Chu Tlekoetsush, Scott Tiaktika Kokoetsa for speaking my language as, as well. Um, you, you do me the, the great honor uh, by doing exactly that. And my wife did, she did uh, lobby and petition for a name like uh, Eagle Soaring in the Blue Sky or something like that. Um, but I am very honored to carry. Um, a name that goes back uh, generations amongst uh, my people. And um, by invoking uh, my language, it, uh, it triggers the, um, what is so common amongst our people to to acknowledge and, and respect that we are on unceded territories of the Algonquin peoples, Machinopsic, Matikitsu, and, and thank them and, and recognize them um, for being here on their lands and to recognize that uh, we, are, we are subject as well to their history and their laws. And um, I'm really appreciative of, of Scott, and I know that there are many here who um, would uh, agree that uh, Scott stands as, as an important leader in this country, not only for the organization that he's represented, but I'm very thankful for his leadership on the national panel for education. And I certainly do share a, a notion that I hope that we are in a moment and um, one that um, also, um, Michelle, I appreciate. Um, having not been in your conference, you did provide a, an excellent um, um, understanding for uh, you know myself, having just arrived here, that we not be daunted by the complexity of our work uh, or the challenges that we might feel are insurmountable uh, in our work, that we, in fact, be inspired to uncover that supposed complexity because that's what it takes is to understand uh, deeply the challenges that we have as a place that you start in order to arrive at solutions, which is the work that um, the national panel is helping us to accomplish. And that report that they will conclude is coming both back to the federal government, I might add, and separately to First Nations. And it's the first such process like that where historically they've principally gone back to the federal government who, who um, independently own um, the, the receipt of and the, the interpretation and implementation of whatever measures might come. So thank you very much uh, for your leadership for, for us. And um, thank you to Imagine Canada and um, 
uh, Mr. Uh, Lozier, for your kind invitation here to this, um, to this very important event. It's truly an honour. I, I know that many would be hearing um, a name uh, like mine or uh, a language like the New Channel, perhaps for, for the very first time. Ours is one um, that is one of about 52 languages uh, from coast to coast to coast. I come from a little village called Ahousit on the west coast of Vancouver Island, and the name that I carry, Ah Inchut, is a name that was held about seven generations ago. There was an Ah Inchut uh, hereditary chief back then. And... Um, this system that I have been raised in goes back um, tens or hundreds of thousands of years uh, out on the West Coast, and, and uh, I'm not alone in that respect. Um, indigenous peoples in North America, around the world, First Nations here in Canada have similar systems. And um, you heard uh, the notion uh, that I, I believe is a shared sentiment or value in a room like this, is the understanding that as human beings, as people, that we are, we are interconnected. And increasingly, we understand through the brilliance of science, uh, but also the encouragement of the, by the retention of the teachings of, of our elders, uh, that this is indeed the case, that we are interrelated, that uh, um, increasingly the recognition that we are interdependent. And I know that um, the work that you're engaged in um, is a culmination of more than two years of, of conversations and consensus building about how to strengthen and improve the incredible work that you already do, that this work has been about thinking differently, uh, as was said, about um, challenging yourselves and forging better understanding. Whatever the issue or community challenge that you face, I'm confident that this work will be an invaluable support for you. But let me just say that this kind of approach is absolutely essential in tackling and bringing new energy and insight to some of the most pressing social policy cha challenges that, that face us all in this country. Some of you may have been uh, following in the course of the media in recent days the story about Attawapiskat, a community in the, the far north of this province. And they're a community facing a long winter, people in tents, people suffering poor health, people without basic supports, and the heart-wrenching images of, of children, um, particularly living in these conditions, and I know that uh, there's a shared sense of shock that uh, this continues to exist in, in a country like Canada. As tragic as, as these images are, it's even more tragic to realize that Attawapiskat is not, in, in fact, an isolated case. The most important part of my job is the time spent in these communities. Of the 634 First Nations in Canada, I know that there are over 150 First Nations that are facing serious structural challenges, difficulty often meeting the very basic needs of their communities. I have a sense that if we did a, an honest assessment, if we arrived at a set of shared criteria of what states of emergencies uh, means, I fear that the number of First Nations in this state would climb to over 100. These are communities across the northern regions and in particular Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and into Quebec, but every single region in the country is impacted. In a report released by the federal government this summer, 73% of all First Nations drinking water systems were concluded to be at risk of failure, causing serious harm. And right now, as we speak, 124 First Nations have water that cannot be consumed from their tap. Nationally, almost half of people living on reserve report mold in their homes and that they are in need of major repair. I could certainly go on and on, citing the terrible statistics that point to the problems. Problems that in particular face our very young and growing population, robbing them of achieving their full potential. And the challenges are urgent and as in other areas of, of life in this country, they seem overwhelming. But I am here to also suggest that there is reason for optimism. I see this in the eyes of our young leaders, determined to turn things around, and I hear it in the kind words as Canadians from all walks of life take a second look and ask simple questions showing that they care and showing that they're willing to build a new understanding with us. First Nations leaders and I are working to increase understanding to transform the relationship among all Canadians to seek new approaches to stable and sustainable funding systems and to pursue opportunities for support and partnership. Fulfilling the full potential of First Nations 
is essential to the Canadian economy, and we need your help, as you are the experts in creating and maintaining social change. First Nations are challenging the assumptions of the past and finding new ways to work together on the ground to smash the status quo. I believe that the charitable and nonprofit sector is uniquely placed to play a pivotal role in our work, and today I propose that we work together to ignite change and transform the reality for the most challenged communities across Canada. My message today is one that builds on what we've already heard here this morning. It's about the action that we can take as individuals, as groups, as Canadians to appreciate the interconnectedness that we all share. That we need to set aside misconceptions, misunderstandings and false choices and capitalize on the strength and opportunity of working with First Nations in this country. We invite you to join the First Nations call to action and use your networks and opportunities to support First Nations in developing and driving plans forward. I'd like to set out for you a path of cooperation and partnership based on a vision of a future where First Nations enjoy a quality of life similar to that of other Canadians, where our people are educated, are employed, where our children can dream of a future of hope and opportunity. And I'm speaking about a major shift, one that is possible, even essential, and it does not require new ideas. After all, our original relationship was founded on mutual respect, mutual recognition and partnership. This vision is still instructive and it grounds our work today. Our ancestors and past leaders had a dream of a better future through partnership and alliance. A dream codified and formalized by many First Nations through treaties and through treaty making. The survival of Indigenous nations today tells us all that this dream is still possible. We know that it was not only First Nations people who had a dream for a better future. Samuel de Champlain, often referred to as Canada's first Governor General, had a different kind of dream too. Champlain dreamed of a society based on partnerships between Indigenous peoples and Europeans to strengthen and to enrich one another. It was a plan completely different from what was being directed by the colonial governments at that time. Displacement, destruction and dominion were the objectives across much of the Americas and the Caribbean. So today, as I talk to you about igniting the need for change, I'm really talking about realizing the dreams of all of our ancestors. These are not dreams that are beyond our grasp. They're not dreams of a perfect world, but of a better world. Dreams of a great nation. Dreams of harmony, of mutual respect, mutual strength and prosperity. First Nations are already advancing plans to make this vision a reality. As you will all appreciate, there is no question that we have a lot of hard work to do. Since contact between European settlers and Indigenous peoples in Canada, there has been a constant and aggressive erosion of First Nations economies, laws and ways of life. As I mentioned at the outset, there are deep structural challenges as we suffer exponentially the poorest socioeconomic conditions of all people in Canada. But hope and optimism comes in many forms. A young girl, some of you may have heard of the late Shannon Kustachin, who was from Attawapiskat, the community that's in the news today. She had a dream of a safe and healthy school for her classmates. Shannon believed in this dream so much and was such a powerful advocate that she convinced her grade eight classmates to cancel their graduation party and instead raise money for a delegation to go to Ottawa to meet the Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs to push for a new school. Shannon had never gone to a real school. She attended classes in portable, sitting on a ground that had been contaminated by a fuel spill. She had never been in a library or been in a gymnasium. Her efforts spawned a movement called Shannon's Dream that is inviting kids across all communities to learn more about this urgent call for quality education. It's, it's inspiring that such a young person would take on this challenge, yet shocking that she would have to live in a country like this in Canada, a country that's prospered from the wealth, from the territories of First Nations peoples, and not have the same opportunities as other kids. Our kids deserve good schools. That's the bottom line. And that's the first priority. 
in a holistic agenda for change. Our work is not, and I emphasize, not to cast blame or to cultivate guilt. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Our work is about inspiring action, both due to the critical needs and the tremendous opportunities. Our work is to actually realize the requirement affirmed by the Supreme Court of Canada that Canada must reconcile its laws, policies and actions with First Nations rights and interests. Reconciliation was committed to in the important apology given to survivors of the residential school. But an apology is about saying sorry. Reconciliation is about getting on with action and achieving fundamental change. So for all of us, for First Nations in Canada, reconciliation then becomes about turning the page on a tragic past and transforming our reality. We know that this has to happen. Otherwise, progress will be incremental, at best, non-existent, at worst. Former Auditor General Sheila Fraser undertook 32 audits related to First Nations, and in her final report after a decade of service, she concluded that things have actually gotten worse. She said the way forward is fundamental transformation. We also, as Scott alluded to, face a demographic urgency. First Nations are the youngest, fastest growing population at a time when the Canadian labour force is ageing. Closing the education and employment gaps for our people would contribute $400 billion in additional output to the Canadian economy and result in savings in government expenditures of $115 billion. Investing our peoples will create jobs, open new economies and new opportunities. Many of our communities are moving forward and taking matters into their own hand, especially in sectors like green energy and green technology. But in order for this effort to truly succeed, we must unlock the full potential of First Nations and sever the shackles of paternalism under the Indian Act. The Indian Act has piled layer upon layer of bureaucratic interference and control on our people. It pins us down. We need to transform this situation. Look to the First Nations that are blazing trails forward. Support that success and increase the rate and pace of change across the country. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, endorsed by Canada just over a year ago, compels us to work together in mutual respect and partnership. This means upholding treaties and allowing First Nations governments to govern and respecting our rights. Over the past two years, First Nations have come together and shared their worldviews on re-establishing our governments. We are diverse people, so there's not only one path forward, but it is a journey with a very clear destination, a destination that affirms our rightful place in our lands, in our territories, that cherishes our children and creates a better future for them. Ultimately, it's the pursuit of self-determination and a clear, respectful partnership with Canada. There are four clear elements leading us down this path that I'd like to briefly cover. The first of which is the First Nations Crown relationship. Secondly is the need for new fiscal relationships. Thirdly is implementation of First Nations governments. And fourth is structural change. Each element has possible paths and each element must be advanced in balance with the others. Advancing the First Nations Crown relationship means making progress to give life to the treaty relationship. We've called for a First Nations Crown gathering to kickstart this work, and I'm hopeful that this will happen early in the new year. This must be a first step that affirms the relationship, sets an agenda, and marks progress and priorities for the future. This must signal the beginning of transforming the relationship away from unilateral control to full partnership. We need new fiscal relationships built on mutually agreed to principles that guarantee and deliver sustainable, equitable services based on agreed-to standards. And we must implement our governments through building our institutions, through planning and accountability mechanisms. And finally, we, we must break down the bureaucracy and institute structural change. This has to be done in a way that recognizes First Nations jurisdiction, our responsibilities as governments and as nations. Right now, the bureaucracy and its policies are controlling our people, and it's failing them. We want nothing more and nothing less than the ability to make the decisions that affect our lives, our lands and our nations and to take responsibility for those decisions. First Nations and our organizations have work to do 
and we're doing it. We are aligning to support and enable nation rebuilding and the successful development of governing institutions with clear accountability, reporting, and direction grounded in our languages and cultures. We're creating nations that are ready to take on the challenges of today. We envision a time in the near future when our governments at their choice and their direction are operating outside the narrow barriers of the Indian Act. This is not only possible, in fact, it's underway, well underway. And this is where I call on you as we mobilize our energies, create momentum and inspire all Canadians, I call on you to join us. I am personally energized by the interest in our issues as a growing chorus of Canadians from all walks of life say, we get it. And what can I do to be part of that change? First Nations are determined to strengthen our citizens, governments and communities for the future of our children and for all of Canada. And as outlined in the treaties, we're willing partners to work with governments, businesses and neighboring communities as we move forward. The nonprofit and charitable sector has played a pivotal role in our communities, particularly now as groups like the Red Cross are mobilizing in, in Attawapiskat. I recently forged a working relationship with Habitat for Humanity, who's done incredible work building scores of homes in places like Haiti and is turning their attention now to the housing needs here in Canada. And on the urging of my wife, who is a big fan of Mike Holmes, Homes on Homes has, has been brought into the equation <laughs> and is stepping up and, and working with us as well. These are examples of, of others, and there are many more who are stepping forward and supporting First Nations to achieve safe and, and adequate housing in their communities. The nonprofit sector and charities are starting to work with our communities. In fact, in many cases, it's been going on for a long time. And we've seen great examples emerge where they work with communities to build and enhance economic development opportunities, including supporting early stage projects that are now self-sustaining because of capacity building and pilot funding. We have emerging examples in the education and health sectors. In all these initiatives, we see your sector, your work, leading to innovation, challenging institutional leadership and achieving clear set goals by not accepting poor outcomes. This is the hallmark of new thinking and new approaches that will drive lasting change. All of you are people who have dedicated your time to firing and driving change, change that smashes the status quo and we look forward to continuing existing and pursuing new partnerships. So if I may conclude where I began, most of what we need is your voice, your networks, and your advocacy to support a vision for a better future for our peoples and for all of Canada. So today I call on you to join our call to action as well. Remembering that First Nation citizens should not need charity in their own lands. If we honor and activate the vision of all of our ancestors and truly work together, we will enable progress and prosperity. This will replace any need for charity, but rather we will uphold our sacred partnerships. By lending your voice and support, by learning more about our peoples, and by supporting our advocacy, we can turn the tide to push the tipping point to transformation. I believe strongly that this is our time. Our time to press forward, to push harder, to engage openly and honestly and have those challenging conversations and ignite the change that's needed today. This is a fight for our children in particular. It's a fight for our future. We simply can't afford to lose another generation. We need to reassure every single young person that we will work for them and we will join them in banishing fear and support them to realize their full potential. They need to see and feel our support so they know that they're not alone, that they don't need to carry the burden of the struggle for a better day for all our peoples, that we are there with every child to make sure that they grow up safe, secure, in their communities and have every chance to learn and to succeed in school. We made, all of us, our ancestors, we made this country together. We can remake it in the original spirit, vision and the dream of our ancestors. We all have a stake. We're all treaty partners. We're all treaty people. Now, than, than, more than ever before in our history, this is the time for us to make this change happen. Thank you so much for the kind invitation to be here.
Um, we're going to take it. I wasn't taking your applause there, I was just standing here. <laughs> it's a great thing about coming up after great speakers, just stand here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chief Atlio. Um, the Chief has agreed to respond to some of the questions that are online and in-room participants have submitted electronically while he was speaking. Um, I'm assuming that most of you were listening and probably didn't get to the questions, so we're going to take 10 minutes uh, so you can you know, discuss with the table. There's a question to, uh, to initiate discussion on the laptop, and you can also um, send a question for the chief to discuss. So we're going to take 10 minutes, and then we'll come back for uh, the questions with Chief Atlio. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Uh, I'm not trying to be mean or anything. It's just uh, the chief has to leave at 10 a.m. sharp, so we want to get as many questions in as possible. So, yeah. Cool. It is cool. So I would like to invite uh, Suzanne Charbonqui, Directrice Générale de Youth Innovation at Sudbury, and Diane Labelle of Davy of the Ontario Trillium Foundation, a major funder of the National Engagement Strategy, to ask a few of your questions to Chief Atlio. Please put your hands together for Diane Labelle, Davy, and Suzanne Charbonqui. Great job. That sounded so French for me, but it's Chabonquit. It's Ojibwe. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, we have a few minutes here. Um, Chief Atlio, uh, what role could the not-for-profit play on reserves, and how do organizations that are not on reserves, not on First Nations, forge partnerships with the communities? How willing do you think the 634 First Nation chiefs are willing to work with the sector? That's a loaded question. <laughs> um, thank you. I, I think, firstly, we begin with, um, with um, a little bit of uh, demystifying the community at large. We know there are three recognized Indigenous peoples um, through the Constitution, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. My role is to support and advocate for the First Nations, um, Indigenous peoples in Canada. And of course, those three recognized Indigenous groups do have people who obviously live in the urban settings as well. And there are organizations that support them, um, be it friendship centers, you know, is one example. Uh, and there are, are many others. And, um, and so I always suggest uh, and encourage those who are involved in responding in policy or programs to support um, to support Indigenous peoples, it, it also, I think, uh, as alluded to earlier, means getting to know uh, the community. And, and uh, as with any uh, support work, whether it's in Canada or around the world, is uh, to seek out the leadership and invite them to uh, offer up how it is that they wish to, to be supported. In, place, in cases like Attawapiskat, there was a cry for help, and there's been an immediate outpouring. Um, I have personal experience in my village when we had 65 uh, attempted suicides and several successful suicides in my own village years ago. My community said, Sean, we, we, can't, we, can't, we can't cope. We need to reach out for help. And um, non-profit, charitable, the education sector reached out and formed, um, formed a, a response whereby they supported the First Nations community to engage in a community planning exercise. They got the young people involved. And they started to develop a vision for activities that they wanted. And uh, things like cleaning up the Inner Harbor, uh, doing an ecotourism uh, trail, um, uh, entrepreneurial project. And years later, that project is still underway. And so it was unique. It was driven by the community. Uh, it was in response to their needs. It involved them. And it brought the people together. And the, the nonprofit orgs, the charitable foundations, the colleges, they brought their expertise, their passion, their capacity, um, and uh, their experience to bear. And so that was the kind of response that has produced results. We're seeing those kinds of examples. Uh, the Homes on Homes project is another example where the community was reaching out. They put their ideas 
um, in front of uh, a, a committee and a project was born. And so I think this notion applies in whether it's in a, a remote isolated reserve community or in the urban setting in Ottawa or Toronto, Montreal, etc. to reach out to get to know the leadership and, and to um, have a conversation about uh, what uh, supports maybe would be uh, needed, if any at all, and uh, to be invited in and uh, to ask to be invited into a conversation. Monsieur le chef national at Lyon. Chief national, you, you spoke up. And what we want to do as a sector is what can we do to support the required changes to the Indian Treaty, to the Indian Act that you mentioned? Uh, I think uh, on a couple of fronts. I think, first of all, it, it's about awareness. Most of us um, in our schooling years did not necessarily, uh, you know, understand that there are 52 languages and Scott uh, did very well to bring out the new Chonot language. Um, or that the treaty relationship making goes back 267 years to the oldest treaty in the Mi'kmaq territory. That over half of Canada um, is under the treaty relationship. And these treaties, uh, very often people say, well, they were in the past, we should forget about the past. Uh, you know, as we approach the, the memorial of the War of 1812, um, let us as a country never forget that uh, our ancestors stood shoulder to shoulder in battle, uh, blood was shed, lives were lost, um, and First Nations were fighting as allies uh, that had forged treaties and been recognized in a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. So it's about recapturing this history of, of this relationship and a better understanding of what it means to be treaty. That if you come from my colleague uh, Jeff Kopanis, where he comes from, treaty number three, they have a really incredibly uh, important um, aspect to their treaty, that uh, treaty number three, that speaks to education. You provide me for a time your son or daughter so that I might teach him or her about who I am and my ways and my people. And then I'll do the same. You teach my children as well about you and your people. That sentiment, that original sentiment has yet to be really captured. And so through education, through curriculum development, um, through working with school districts, school boards, through reaching out and, and recognizing that right now we don't have funds for things like uh, language. If oh, for 150 years the residential schools were a specific policy to take the language and the, and the tide of family and culture and territories to take it away, what First Nations are seeking is a, a way, perhaps through education, to return the language and return the connection to family, culture, territories. And for us to begin demystifying what has so often been pushed aside as well as too complex. This is too difficult. And so it does require some effort to raise our level of understanding about one another. And so that, that, that I think, is, is an import, important place to start. Um, do we, do we um, welcome advocacy not only for responses on the ground and in the communities? Absolutely. Is it time to encourage for this government, all parliamentarians, and um, every single uh, provincial and territorial government to seize this moment? I, I would not hesitate to invite you to, to join us in that major national call that this be a transformative moment. How that, how that gets interpreted and how that work um, is carried out, whether it's encouraging MPs or the Prime Minister, we really, are, we really are suggesting that we do need to call for a major shift in this country and that it's going to take all of us to accomplish that. So it's a call for support for advocacy. How that gets carried out, we'd welcome your advice as well about you know, what form that takes. Thank you. Okay, hey, quick note. It's already moving really quickly. There was an organization that has stepped up to the plate and is contributing some support to the First Nations. I can't tell you any more details than that, but it happened just a few minutes ago, I believe, online. And uh, yeah, so they're starting to engage and they, they want to. They're, they're interested. Okay, we only have a couple of minutes. One more question for the Chief. Um, how can the not-for-profit charitable sector be best contribute to the First Nations gathering planned for the new year? How can we get involved? Um, that's a that's a very good question that maybe ties to your to your last question. Um, two summers ago, in the in summer of 2010, the Chiefs and Assembly I hold national. Um, the Assembly of First Nations holds two major national gatherings per year. 
one in the winter, which we will be holding next week here in Ottawa, and a major AGA in the summer. In the summer of 2010, uh, the First Nations leader said um, it's time that, that we sought to um, reset the relationship with the Crown. We should call for a First Nations Crown gathering. Uh, President Obama has held uh, two, and I think he's holding his third this week down in the United States. Uh, and this reflects the fact that my role as National Chief in the Assembly of First Nations, we are an advocacy organization. Um, it's First Nations citizens and their governments. They're the ones who are responsible as signatories to treaty and they hold title and rights. And it's their governments who, are, who we are supporting to be empowered. And so um, next week, the uh, chiefs, um, we will be gathering. We hope that by next week, we will have a firm date for a First Nations Crown gathering early in the new year. And it will be the chiefs, I have the responsibility to support, to open the door or to encourage for the federal crown partner to come meaningfully to the table. And so any efforts to either A, reach out to support First Nations, to be actively engaged, we have deep capacity challenges in our communities, we have the need to, to, to con continue to build our economies. Natural Resource Canada said in uh, a number of years back that uh, there would be hundreds of billions of dollars in natural resource projects that would be implicated. We've seen some of that activity already in the news, but it also tells us that there's, cr there's tremendous potential um, on the economic side. So much of this relates back to this key priority of education, that if we can achieve success to unleash the success of our, of our young people, um, we, we already referenced earlier what kind of um, economic uh, potential this has. But I believe that uh, most importantly, this is about gravitating quickly to those learners, especially to the young people, and finding ways to support them. And there are youth organizations um, that are, that are um, um, in existence, uh, Suzanne, um, like yours and, and, and others. And so as we lead, I'm hoping that this is a moment that's arriving. And uh, if, if, if it is truly a moment and there's going to be a transformation and a significant change, I mean, Scott won't even tell us what's in his report yet. So um, in, some, in some respects, it's like we're facing right now the unknown of what might be. And there's a, there's a sense in this country that I get from young people periodically. And it's a, it's a difficult one. And it, it just tears at my heart and it does any who spend time in our communities. And it's, it's the kind of sentiment that, that we don't matter and that the leadership are afraid. And I think if, if we do anything in this moment, uh, we gravitate um, as fast as we can as a country to take up the challenge, to understand and underscore that this challenge has plagued this country for decades. It's plagued it for generations. You remember back in the Trudeau era, alas, the Indian problem is still with us, was said back in 1969. We've seen tremendous progress. Indian control of Indian education first arose in the 70s. My dad pursued and achieved an academic doctor degree. Um, my late grandmother was with me in the House of Commons when the country stood up and the Prime Minister uttered the important apology to the residential school era and my late grandmother said, grandson, they're beginning to see us. And she passed away a couple of years later. And um, she said, and this is probably uh, um, the, the note that I'll, that I'll end on here, because I don't have, you know, a list of suggestions for what, um, for what this moment uh, requires. She said, grandson, I was uh, a fighter all my life. I raised uh, 17 kids. Uh, each one of them are fighters. They all went to residential school. And she says, we no longer fight our fight with our fists any longer. We fight our fight with education. And that's the legacy she left her family. That's the legacy or the instructions I hear from elders from coast to coast to coast. I really think this is an important moment in, our, in the history of our country, one that we need to seize. And we do need your, um, your commitment, your dedication, your inspiration, and your advice, your guidance, and your energy to seize this moment. What that looks like if we were to have this crown gathering in January, I, I want to ask you that as well. Um, what's possible? If we continue to work in isolation, then we're doing what my father always reminded me so frustratingly when I couldn't get my Algebra 11 work figured out. Son, there's a hard way or the harder way. <laughs> there is no easy way. It was deeply frustrating. 
until I embraced that notion. And what he was saying, of course, is that the harder way is if we choose not to put our complete effort into this. The harder way is if we choose to remain a path that's divided, where we don't seek to achieve better understanding about what has become the other. The harder way is to remain in a pattern of blaming and unilateralism, and uh, just to allow an Attawapiskat to burst onto the national scene, fade into the backdrop until the next crisis arrives. So I suggest let's get on with the hard work of reconciling between First Nations and Canada, and let's gravitate quickly to support those young people. So thanks again for the questions and for having me. Miigwech. Wanchi miigwech. That's actually quite um, touching. Uh, my name is Wapshka Miigwanekwa, which means white feather woman in my culture, which is Ojibwe. I'm from the Crane Clan. And it gives me great honor to be with our national chief. I've been watching him since he was elected. <laughs> we stayed up all night for you. <laughs> July 23rd. Because it was really important for us and for us younger generations that are coming up behind. You know what, one thing just I'll just leave with you is to, you know, to test the true character of a person is to give them power. Whether that's influence, money, trust. And our national chief has stayed and remained true and very authentic with us and very personable. And that's something that's really important to us and part of our teachings. So it's a truly honor, true honor to have him here and, um, and to be amongst you all. An elder had said that one of the greatest gifts is awareness and that's something that we leave with the not-for-profit and charitable sector. And um, on behalf of the summit participants, chi gumach chi, chi, which is big, thank you, in Ojibwe. And I'll say Bama P until later, National Chief. <laughs> 